I, I just felt impressed to ask for volunteers. Um, we're expecting God to move this morning. I, I need some people who want to partner with me. I know this is radical in our Western culture. Sunday afternoon is the afternoon that we put on the major feed bag, and then we take a nap. I, I just feel compelled to ask. I, I need 10 volunteers who said this afternoon until after this evening service, I'm going to fast. For this evening service, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I know it seems radical, but we're in radical times. We need God to move. The souls would be saved. Thank you for your sacrifice this afternoon. I'll just thank you in advance. Youth, if you want to have a fundraiser, there's going to be some hungry people after service tonight. <laughs> I would ask you to continue to pray. So glad to see Kathy with us this morning. She was unable to walk and be here last week. Please continue to pray for Sister Shirley Kessner. I was with her in the ER yesterday. She is home. Pray for her recovery. Also, with Herman Robinson fell last night. He is banged up and bruised would ask you to pray for him his wife karen is in the middle of chemo treatments but god has been faithful to her in the journey continue to pray for her and today is a special day we're going to have a baptism after the preaching this morning and then we're going to have a baptism tonight and we have several birthdays i just want to magnify one of them right now sister karina had a birthday yesterday <clears throat> she is 18 again <laughs> A happy birthday to you, a happy birthday to you. May you feel Jesus near every day of the year. A happy birthday to you, a happy birthday to you, and the best year you've ever had. Amen for that. We're going to ask you to do something. I'm glad of a lot of things, but I'm glad to see my friend Danny today. I love Danny. He is my friend. If you love the Lord, I want you to get out of your seat and greet one of them and say, I'm glad you are here today.
Wow, you guys really are friendly. If you have your Bibles today, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 30. 1 Samuel 30. While you're turning there, if you did not get your Pentecost is a Smyrna water bottle. We have some. Let me know after service. We'll get you some. Carry them to your workplace. It's a great conversation starter. What are you drinking? I'm drinking from the river of life. Ah. Mm. Lay it on. First Samuel chapter 30. Going to read a couple of verses and then we're going to pray. The Bible says in verse 30, verse 1, And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Zitlag in the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag, and smitten Ziklag, and burned it with fire, and had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away, and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives, and their sons, and their daughters were taken captive. I, I want to preach a, something maybe you think you've heard before. Maybe you just need to hear it again. Uh, but life does happen. We are out busy doing the work that we have to do to survive, to pay bills, to make the mortgage, to buy groceries, to get the air conditioner fixed. Can I get a witness right there? Amen. And when they came home from doing the work, the enemy had come in and taken what they cherished and burned what was left. I want to preach today, and then we're going to, we're going to give you a title, and we're going to pray. I want to preach today, uh, it ain't over till it's over. I'm going to say it again. It ain't over. Till it's over. Let me give you a subtitle. You may lay down a loser, but you're going to wake up a winner. Put your Bibles down. Jesus, today we draw nigh to you, not just with our lips, uh, but with our whole heart today. We desire to hear your word. God, stir up the spirit of the Holy Ghost that's within us. God, let our hope be made manifest. God, let we confirm that we believe through the manifestation of worship. Let the heart receive a good word today that the weary may not fail. Those that are broken would not give up. And of all things, let us have hope to the end we shall endure. And the church say amen. Give God a hand clap of praise today as you're seated. It was at the end of World War II, a long-standing president, FDR, had died. His vice presidential running mate, Harry S. Truman, assumed the position of president. It came time for an election. Many people in the country thought we needed change. The governor of New York named Dewey, who had had great success revitalizing the economy of New York, ran as the Republican challenger. He had a wide lead in the polls after the convention all the way up to election day. Many had told Truman he might as well concede. He had to admit later that he had been looking for moving companies to take his family's possessions out of the White House to the family home in Missouri. He had been making a train track campaigning feverishly at the last minute, making a stop near St. Louis to spend the night. He had gone to bed reading the headline, Dewey Wins, New President of the United States. He went to bed a loser. But it ain't over until all the votes are counted. Can I give you a word today? No matter what your detractors are saying, it ain't over till it's over. 
Well, I don't have a majority on my side. If you find out the will of God and you accept the will of God and you contend for the will of God, can I give you a word? A majority is wrong, but one person in the will of God is a majority. It doesn't matter what everybody else is doing or not doing. You are a winner when you obey the Lord. It's time to quit listening to the detractors. The people who say we can't, can't, never could. It's time to quit hearing, you can't go back. You've gone too far. You've done too much. You must accept the status quo. I don't accept that premise at all. If I believe that, Sister Brenda, why eat? I'm just going to get hungry again. If I break my leg, why would I go through physical therapy? I'm going to die sometime in the future. Why take a bath or brush my teeth? I'm just going to get dirty again. Can I give you a word in case you're missing the gist of what I'm trying to say today? Is that we've got not to accept the premise of the naysayers. What we've got to adapt is through Christ Jesus, I can do the can has never been a problem. It's that we won't do. Today, I've made up my mind. No matter what everybody else is doing, I'm going to serve the Lord. What a sad, defeated attitude. I call it a poor mentality. Why bother saving? Why bother working? Why bother trying to do better? I'm going to always be broke. That is not what the Bible teaches. You are not just the product of your environment, although environment does matter. Try to grow tomatoes in concrete. Environment does matter. But you are not the product of your environment. You're a product of the decisions you made while in your environment. You cannot always control what happens to you, but you must control how you respond to what happens to you. I believe that God has alternative endings for each and every one of our lives. You heard me. Yes, God knows what cross we're going to have to bear and what path lays before us but he leaves it up to us how we respond to what happens to us the bible says that david was with the mighty men of valor and they came home and the enemy had taken their families and burned their houses they who were around him, the Bible says they were distressed. They were drama driven. The sky is fallen. What are we going to do when we let ourselves be distressed to a point? Distressed by what Marion Webster's dictionary means suffering the, the effects on the mind or the body of pain. It is not just physical, it can be mental pain. Distress left unattended will result in discouragement, the making of people less likely to do something. A defeated attitude. You look at 1 Samuel chapter 30, they were greatly distressed, and the Bible says they wanted to stone David, and David went and got by himself, the Bible says, and encouraged himself. Why? It's because he was in the midst of people that were discouraged. You're not maybe getting what I'm saying today, but if you allow yourself to live in the midst of distressed people that never can and never will, you never will. You will let that attitude be pervasive in your thinking. But the Bible says that David got by himself. And begin to encourage himself. What does that look like, Pastor? I believe he got away from those. The Bible says they had wept so much they couldn't cry no more. David got out of the midst of the morning and got over and, and began to magnify the Lord. He began to encourage himself. Now, I'm going to tell you, if you're listening 
to what comes out of country music headquarters, you're not going to be encouraged. I believe David got the red back hymnal out and began to sing, Victory in Jesus, my Savior, forever. He sought me and bought me with his re... Boot scooting boogie ain't never going to give you what the blood of Jesus is going to give you. I'm telling somebody... He got away from the negative, and he began to encourage himself. He began to sing songs. When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he has done for me, my soul does cry. You can sing, there's a tear in my ear from lying on my back all you want to, but when I think of the goodness of Jesus... Pastor, that's elementary preaching. We want to have our scholastic aptitude stretched. I'm telling you what, it's just a simple truth. When I magnify the Lord, he becomes bigger than my problem. What I'm worried about is no longer a concern because greater is he who's in me than he that is in the world. I reckon this present suffering is not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. I think David began to talk to himself. Intelligent people talk to themselves. Right, Brother Benson? We talk to ourselves all the time, don't we? Somebody asked Brother L.H. Benson why he talked to himself. He said, I want to talk to an intelligent man. That's why. I love it. I talk to myself. Some of y'all think I work on the building because I'm bored. I work on the building because I like to be near the presence of the Lord. I'm working on the building. I'm working on the building. I'm praying over empty chairs. They're going to be full chairs. I'm praying over unfinished classrooms. That God's already got people going to knock down the door to get in here. I get talking to myself. Can you imagine David beginning to encourage himself? I can still hear the words of Samuel telling my seven brothers that they wasn't the one. And when I came near unto the prophet Samuel, he said, this is the one. And David's going, and I still remember that oil that he poured over. I can still smell the anointing as it runs all over me. I know my circumstance is dark. I know my children are gone. I know the city is burned. But I remember the anointing. The same anointing that came on me when I was watching the sheep uh, and a lion come and got a little lamb in his mouth and was going to take it off. Uh, and a bear came in unexpectedly and was going to destroy all the sheep. And God gave me the anointing that allowed me to break the back of the lion and slew the bear. I think he began to think about uh, if God can give me the power over a lion, if God can give me the power over a bear, if the name of Jesus can give me authority over a giant. Sometimes we get so focused on our problem, we forget what God has already done. But when I think about his goodness and all he's done for me, Y'all not with me? I'm telling somebody we need to get away from the distraction and we need to encourage our... Show me where God came and spoke to him. God would have allowed David's free will to be exercised if David had sit in zit lag and said, I deserve it, stone me. Show me where God was going to stop it. He was anointed king... Of Israel, but he wouldn't have been recorded as the king if he had allowed his circumstance to allow discouragement to bring defeat. Y'all, y'all going, whoa, that's heavy, Pastor. He got isolated. He overcame discouragement and he encouraged himself. And he began to think, look at what God has already done. I'm just crazy enough to believe that if God gives me the victory over a bear and a lion and over a giant, the same God is able to give me the victory over the Malachites. And maybe you don't know who the Malachites are. 
You can go back to chapter 15 of the same book. That was the people that Saul was supposed to have destroyed utterly. Can I give you a word? The reason some of y'all are fighting some of the battles you're fighting is you were unwilling to destroy utterly the enemy. I can handle Netflix, but I'm going to stop at that R. I can handle the Internet, but I'm, I'm just going to research good things. I go on and on. I, I can handle this prescription pain. I can dabble in this illicit relationship. I can Some of the battles we're fighting is because we didn't allow the God of heaven to utterly destroy the enemy that wants to destroy our soul. David said, I could sit here and blame Saul forever, but it's not going to change the thing of where I'm at. You need to quit worrying about what everybody else did or did not do. You need to know today is the day of the Lord. Who's made mistakes? Who's done stupid? Who thought you could work it out on your own and do it your own way? And who has allowed that to talk you out of allowing God to come in? I don't care if it's on the first day of trouble or the 49th day of trouble or the 99th day of trouble. I'm glad when you wake up, you may lay down a loser. But when you wake up and have a revelation that God is able through the anointing to bring us out. David went and worshipped. And he began to praise God. He began to think about what God had done. And guess what? He began to wake up. The next thing he did let me inquire. Encourage. When you're discouraged, you don't ask no questions, do you? Who's been discouraged enough that you stayed home from church? Two or three hands. Who has been discouraged enough that you've dodged pastor's text message and emails? Two or three honest people. I don't want to hear no preaching. I don't want to hear no testimony. I'm going to turn my radio off. I'm going to put all my CDs in storage, and I'm just going to sit here. Can I ask you a question? How's that working for you? How's that working for you? God has made a way out of no way, but it comes to a point you got to be willing to get up. I know this isn't popular, but it is true. I know God is able to do all things, but he can't do what you won't do for yourself. Quit having a pity party and come and ask God, what would he have you do? The Bible says he went to the priest and says, give me the ephod. I could spend a whole Sunday talking about why he shouldn't have had the ephod. That's another sermon. But David got on the ephod and he began to inquire. The Lord began to walk back and forth, began to hang on to the anointing. And he began to say, should I pursue them or should I just stay here? You know what he's really saying? Should I accept the status quo? Should I believe the report that I'm going to lose? Or should I keep pressing on? Should I keep fasting? Should I keep believing? Should I keep reading? I know that child has said, I don't want to have nothing to do with God, but it ain't over yet. My God is able to get a hold of people that say, I'll never go to church. Woo! It's going to take God. Guess what? God is able. It ain't over. The word of the Lord, all God said to him was pursue. He had free will. He could have had a pity party and died right there. But when he encouraged himself, then he inquired of God. And he said, God, should I stay here? Should I pursue? Giving up is not an option. Stop. Giving up is not a good option. It is an option. Guess what? 600 men took off with him. But when they got to the edge of the battle, the Bible says he prayed and asked direction of how to attack the situation. My Bible says it went from 600 to 400. 200 men that started out with him didn't stay with him. They got squeamish, fearful, anxiety-ridden. Can I, can I tell you what? That's pretty common. 200 of 600 is one-third can I, take, can I break the church down for you? There is one third that is on fire. They're willing to storm the gates of hell with a water pistol. It don't matter. Come on. Suey, pastor, let's get him. There's one third of the church that are influenced. If the one third that believes is vocal, they're vocal. If the one third who don't, that do believe are not vocal, they're not vocal. And there's that other third, it don't matter what you do, they're not going to do it. 
They're here, but they ain't going to do it. They're coasters. They're sconces. That bears out in the heavens, does it not? There's one-third of the angels that were loyal and one-third that wasn't going on the journey, and they were contending for that other third. You know who pastor's reaching for today? There are some people, they are never going to call me pastor. They're never going to obey the scriptures. They're never going to serve the Lord. And that's their choice. There's a third. It wouldn't matter if they put a yellow German shepherd in here. They're going to come to church. They're going to worship the God. goes, I'm reaching for that third that is able to be influenced. That says, I don't know. I'm telling you, you can know if you inquire of the Lord. What must I do to be saved? He will speak to you and say, you must repent, be baptized, and receive the Holy Ghost. But if you want to just sit there and coast and feel good about yourself, you can do that too. Not everybody is going to go on the journey. Second Kings tells us of a Shunammite woman that said, there comes the prophet day by day. And it's dusty on this journey. And there's no good place to lodge when you hear where he's going. Why don't we build a little room, a little lean-to? on the house and we'll put him a candlestick and a table in the bed and when he comes by here he'll have a place to stay oh that's so nice it so touched the prophet elisha he said hey i know it's past your years <laughs> i know it's past your years but you've always wanted a child so i'm going to give you a son ah! don't tease me that's what she said that's the southern version don't tease me don't you tease me sure enough she had a child. Child was doing what sons of agrarian fathers do. He's out in the field. The Bible said, my head, my head. He fell over. And he died. His mother rocked him until noon. Dead baby. I'm afraid if we're not careful, we'll spend the rest of our lives complaining about what went wrong in our lives. Rocking dead babies. Choosing just to dwell on the broken and the failed and the flawed. Trying to pick out the inconsistencies that we perceive in Scripture and the problems within the church. And we're sitting there rocking dead babies and it ain't never going to come to nothing. But the Bible says, at the noon, when the sun was at its highest, she took the lad and laid him in the prophet's room. I'm telling you, she had made a place in her home for the things of God. She didn't put him in the den. She didn't put him in the kitchen. She didn't put him in the refrigerator. She didn't put him in the playroom. She put him in the place where the man of God was at. And she locked the door. Didn't want nothing to touch him until she came back. She went. Y'all trust me to paraphrase? Good, thank you. Second Kings chapter 4. You can look it up when you get home. She drew near to the prophet. And Gehazi said, prophet, man of God. There comes the Shunammite woman. It's her. Run down to her and see if all is well. Is all is well with you? Is your husband good? All is well. Okay, well then you can come up and see the prophet. And when she got near the prophet, she ran and fell on his feet. Submission. Subjected to the prophet. And Gehazi began, the Bible says, if you go back to the Hebrew, he began to kick her off of him like a dog. And the prophet said, Stop! Can't you see her soul is vexed within her? God did not show me, nor did he tell me that the boy is dead. Do you get what I'm telling you? God could have told the prophet that the boy had died and the prophet was sensitive enough to the Holy Ghost. He could have showed up at the house and prayed for the boy. Sadler believes that God had left the finish of the boy's life blank and waited to see what mama's decision was going to be. If she was willing to accept the status quo, my baby's dead, guess what? Her baby would have been dead. But she wasn't happy with that conclusion of the matter. So she put him in a place where the anointing rests. Some of you mamas need to carry those babies into the prayer room and begin to say, I know they're not in church. I know they're not saved yet. But I'm going to lock them in the place and cover them with the blood and shut the door where the enemy can't get to them. 
And then I'm going to go and do whatever it takes. The prophet said, God just totally left me out of this because he wanted to see how she would respond. You know how, you know what happened? Because she answered all as well. Because she didn't sit there complaining continually about her broken situation that it can't ever be fixed. God allowed the prophet to come and pray over that child and brought his life back and restored him to his mother. What you talking about today, preacher? I'm not following you. It's like this. Some of you have ex accepted the status quo. Some of you have been willing to allow past failures, past hurts. Well, you don't know what he did to me, or she won't support me, or he won't let me, or they did this, or they did that. How long are you going to rock that situation of your past and let your past dictate your future? Or at what point are you going to begin to encourage yourself and remember again the anointing and the calling of God that's without repentance on your life? I can talk about me. I left everything I knew, packed everything I had up in a U-Haul, moved to another state, took a wife and two kids. One was an infant and moved them in a place that you probably wouldn't move to. So we could have church so I could fulfill the will of God. I moved two or three times, followed what I was told to do, did it with a good attitude. And you know what? When it was just about to hit the payoff, men stacked the deck against me, reshuffled the deck, and dealt me out. And if I would have allowed that, that could have made me bitter. I was at a low point in 1996. I had made up my mind if I never preached again, it would be okay. I just want to serve the Lord. I want to make sure my family saved. I'm not even sure if God can or will use me. Anybody been hurt like that? Anybody backed off on what God's called you to do because you've been miserable, unhappy, disconcerted? I want you to know that I went to a preacher's conference. I rode 12 hours in an unair conditioned van with a bunch of yahoos. I slept in a bunk in a dormitory in January in Louisiana, and it was cold, and there was no heat in there. And I went to Because of the Times, and the Lord began to stir that calling on my life where I was just going to serve the Lord and smile but never do anything again, just be a member. Sister Mariah, is she not in here? How many people are seated in that sanctuary? 5,000? 3,000? I'm one of 3,000. There's people sitting on all the steps, sitting on all the floors, sitting on all the stage. And I'm up on the shelf. That's that transitional space where you like climb steps, but they put shelves kind of in. We're all kind of sitting on the shelves. And I'm, in, I'm on the uh, piano side, about two-thirds of the way up in the middle. There's 12 people on this side of me and 12 people on this side of me. And the pastor hosting the conference, he's a speck about this big out in the distance. Be careful when you tell God you will if he will. I said, God, if you want me to continue to preach. Ridiculous, Sister Dismukes. Ridiculous. Let that preacher come up here and pray for me. I had no more and got them words out of my mouth. And he began to zigzag in the crowd. He began to go over. You know, oh, he's going to pray for them. No, he didn't. He didn't stop. He went over here, went over. He cares. Then he starts coming up the steps, and I got a lump in my throat. I, I said, oh, Lord. He's coming up here, and God's told him everything, and he's going to embarrass me. And I thought, well, there's 12 people on it. He can't get to me. I didn't know Pentecostal preachers were so unorthodox. He got up on that pew. <coughs> he's going to go past me. He stopped and slapped that size 12 hand on my head. Pow. He didn't know my name then. He don't know my name now. But he said, what you have begun in him, I want you to finish it. And he leaned down and spoke in my ear. And he said this, if you'll do your part, God will do his part. 
What I'm telling you is you can sit there and rock dead babies and complain about your situation or you can encourage yourself and get up and gird up the loins of your mind and have a revelation that if I do my part, God's going to be faithful to his part. No, 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 no. Come on, stand up. And it wasn't five minutes and I was talking myself out of it. Y'all ever done that? Preacher's preaching right to you. It's like he knew your name, address, belly button size. He's got it all. And he walks away, and in five minutes, you're talking to yourself how that couldn't have been real, couldn't have been for you, just a coincidence. And Brother Merle Ewan got up and got a microphone. I didn't know Merle Ewan. He grabbed a microphone. I want to say 4,000 people in that room, easy. He said, honey, you're already talking yourself out because you think the way back is way too hard. And he began to sing a song called, you're going to make it. You're going to make it. No matter what you go through, if you hang on to God, you're going to make it. There was a mother going to accept the status quo and she was going outside the city of Nain to bury her boy. But Jesus interrupted that funeral. But Neymar, it ain't over. I don't care what doctors say until God says it's over, it ain't over. Mary and Martha were hurt. If you'd have been here, he wouldn't have died. Don't you understand? He don't have to be there. It's whenever he chooses to show up, it'll be okay. And you've given up because God didn't get there and do what you thought he should when you thought he should. It ain't over. It ain't over. It ain't over. But Taylor, 5,000 people stood on the Mount of Olives when Jesus ascended. And the angel says, the same Jesus whom you've seen, he's coming back again. 5,000. But go ye to Jerusalem till ye be endued with power from on high. It was but a Sabbath day's journey, a thousand yards. 5,000 on the man, mountain, only 120 in the upper room. I think too many people talked themselves out of it from the top of the mountain to the upper room. Some of you today are thinking, you're thinking of your situation, you're thinking of your loved one, you're thinking of, of the burden and ministry you have that you're not fulfilling at the present. And you're beginning to justify and explain. Why don't today, as Julie sings, why don't you come and take a season? Stop. Before you even do that, right now in your seat, begin to encourage yourself. Come on. Begin to remember what God's already done. He's already helped you overcome depression. God has already filled you with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Come on, tell yourself. I got three kids and two of them are serving God. If God can save Sally, God can save Benny. God can save the third one. But man, my ministry, I wrecked it. It wasn't your ministry anyway. You're made an overcomer by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. If you sit silent, you're accepting the status quo. Now, Julie's going to sing right now. And I want you to come today and inquire of the Lord. Come and ask Him how He's going to put it back together. You wash me in mercy. Clean, there's nothing to bury that you can make worthy. You wash me in mercy. I am clean, there's nothing to dirty that you can make worthy. Wash me in my